Today's topic, Cam versus Feature Cam. Um, really, I'm going to give you um, some background on the different Cam softwares that Autodesk has um, and kind of the differences between what you would see with a more traditional CAD Cam or Cam system versus Feature Cam um, and some of the advantages you get uh, by using an automated uh, Cam software like Feature Cam and some of the neat things you can do with that. So we'll jump right in here. Uh, a little background about myself, um, mechanical engineer by trade, worked uh, in industry, um, doing a lot of work within aerospace, product development, and manufacturing. Um, I've done everything from design work all the way up through um, running a CNC machine um, and doing stress analysis, FEA, and CFD. Um, so that's kind of my skill set here at Imagine It. I handle the majority of our simulation uh, business regarding NASTRAN, CFD, and then I also assist with CAM. Um, Fusion 360 generative design workflows as well. I am based out of Denver, so I'm in mountain time, and uh, hopefully uh, we can connect in the future. So a little bit about Imaginic Technologies. If you're not familiar with us already, uh, we are a platinum uh, reseller. We are one of Autodesk's um, biggest partners, so we help sell their software, but we do more than that. Um, we also provide services, so that can be anything from training to implementation, uh, we can work with your product data management system. We have a software development team. We have a support team. So uh, we really have a very skilled group here at Imagine It, and our goal is to get you up and running with software and using it as efficiently as possible to solve really your toughest problems. So throughout the U.S. and Canada, we have um, over 30 training centers as well as mobile labs. We can come to you if you would rather do training um or station on site at your own company facility we can do that as well we also have um, a partnership with ascent so we are under the same umbrella called ran technologies with ascent they actually develop all of the standardized autodesk training content so we work with them directly to actually develop the books uh, that are used for training on really any autodesk software across the entire platform so really what we can handle and what we can do for you is uh, we can help you save money. So if you want to reduce costs, we have a lot of experience um, in improving your design workflows, improving your, improving your product data management, improving how you collaborate within a company. We work within manufacturers to implement new uh, CAM softwares like I'll show you today um, to help save time on programming. Um, we can really help you accelerate innovation. So really help you push your company forward and modernize your systems to uh, take advantage uh, of this technology. So we're broken into a lot of different teams here at Imagine It. Um, we can provide consulting as well, um, whether you need directed training or actual consulting. Uh, we help with everything from uh, BIM and CAD management through CAM services, so CNC programming, for your mill or your lathe or a five axis machine. We also have a dedicated simulation uh, consulting capability. So we can do CFD uh, or FBA simulations for you um, and provide those results directly to your team to help you better design products. Um, we can develop content. We can um, develop a plugin or a software application for you. So we have a dedicated software team that's capable of modifying um, existing Autodesk software or creating your own software platform to interface with uh, your existing CAD platform. And we also offer training across the board. With that, we have a portal called Productivity Now, just to be aware of. Uh, Productivity Now is an e-learning platform that Imagine has developed, um, specifically built around BIM and CAD um, training. Uh, on that platform, you can learn anything from uh, design, to automation, to CAM, to FEA. Uh, and it's a great e-learning platform that allows you to um, set milestones um, and really train your entire team um, in a really unique way. Um, on that platform, there's everything from um, videos, white papers, the actual Ascent training books are loaded onto that platform. So it's a great way that you can search um, for what you need and get the training you need quickly um, at your own pace. So that's a little bit about Imagine It. Jumping into the agenda for today, 
I'm going to be discussing the different CAM offerings that Autodesk has um, and comparing them side by side. From there, I'll jump into what makes Feature CAM unique. Um, and that's really the strategy and process standardization, the automation that comes with tool selection and strategy, strategy selection. Um, I'll show you how feature recognition works and how powerful that can be when you're programming more complex parts. And then I'll also discuss a little bit uh, of the advantages around Vault for Make, uh, which is the ability to actually store your data and control revisions um, of your NC programs. I will be doing a live demo as well, so you'll get to see the software in action a little bit, and uh, hopefully that leads to some good questions and answers after our session as well. So kind of high-level view here. If you were to compare some of the primary Autodesk CAM offerings, I do not have PowerMill listed here, but there is PowerMill, which uh, I've shown in some previous webcasts as well. Today, we're going to be focusing on the differences between your more traditional CAM platforms like Fusion 360 and Inventor CAM. Those are part of, part of the product design and manufacturing collection versus Feature CAM. <clears throat> and you can see just looking at this list, they all can do milling, they all can do turning. Uh, you have five axis capability included with all three of these platforms. But if you have a mill, a lathe, and a wire EDM machine, FeatureCam can program all of those options. So you have that wire EDM capability built in as well. Another thing you'll see is CAD associativity. That's something FeatureCam does not have. So if you are working on a design where you're regularly making changes to the geometry and you need your CNC programming to update automatically, that CAD associativity can be very advantageous. So in the early stages of a design, it might make sense to use Fusion 360. But as you progress into high volume programming, where you're programming a lot of the same things, uh, or you are programming customer parts where there are not necessarily going to be significant geometry changes, that's where uh, FeatureCam really comes um, to play and you really don't need that CAD associativity at all times. Pull recognition, feature recognition, feature cam has both of those. This allows you to automatically program your parts without having to choose tools. You don't have to choose boundaries. You don't have to figure out what step over and step down to use. You can set your preferences and the software will automatically recognize and apply the knowledge that you already have rather than having to remember it for every single operation on your part. That also comes with strategy standardization. So rather than having to um, remember the changes you make each time you program a new part, um, as you learn and as you identify what your machine does well, you can build that into the standards that FeatureCam uses so that you're always getting a consistent um, and repeatable product. So I'm gonna be focusing on those three things today. Um, I think that's really what sets feature cam apart from other cam softwares is the automated feature recognition, tool selection, and then the standardization that comes with that. So first, let's just talk about a traditional cam workflow. So this would be typically what you would see from Fusion 360 or Inventor Cam uh, if you're familiar with either of those. So you're going to be drawing and importing your part, right? So that's going to be the first step here. Create your geometry. From there, you're gonna create your setup. That's gonna be defining your stock boundary um, and your coordinate system. Then what type of operation do you wanna use? Do you wanna be facing? Are you gonna be doing some roughing, some finishing, some drilling? What operation do you want? What boundary are you applying that operation to? What type of tool path do you want to use? What type of tool? What feeds and speeds are you gonna use? What step over and step down? Then once you've done all of that, you have all of that figured out, you've made all of your selections, you can simulate it, generate your code, and then you're good to go. The problem is you have to repeat that for every single operation. So if I'm doing a pocket and then I'm going to do a drilled hole and then I'm going to do a um, bore, I have to go through and figure out what operation type to use, what tool to use, what feeds and speeds to use, and I have to do this for every single operation on a part. So if you've got a part that has like six operations, this can be really time consuming. The other problem with this is a lot of it is tribal knowledge. So tribal knowledge really being only a select group of people might know this information or 
you might have one veteran machinist that has all this in their head, or maybe they've been making changes to the code on the machine and no one else is aware of that. The other issue is if you identify a better way of doing things, you have to remember that every single time and you have to train the rest of your staff on how to apply the correct feeds and speeds or apply the correct step over and Z step. There's a lot of training and knowledge sharing that needs to take place. And in the modern workplace, a lot of times that doesn't happen. A lot of times one person will have all the knowledge and if they leave the company, that knowledge goes with them. So the advantage of feature cam is that you can define configurations that save the feeds and speeds that you wanna use, the tools you want to use and the strategies you want to use so that it's not tribal knowledge anymore. So this is really the downfall of a traditional cam workflow right there. So problems with it. Long programming times, right? I talked about how many selections you need to make. That takes time. Time is money. Lack of standardization. So there's really no standard across the board. You could have each machinist or each programmer doing completely different things based off of their training and their experience and their knowledge of the machine. You have a lot of steps. So more steps, guess what that means? More chances to make mistakes. I know when I'm programming a part and I'm going through each process, I make mistakes all the time. And it's not for lack of knowledge, it's just there's a lot to get through. If you're taking 30 minutes to program a part, there's a lot of opportunity to make mistakes or uh, make a change that's not repeatable. The other thing is inconsistent strategy selection. So same with standardization. You could have each team member choosing a different strategy based off of what they think is best or what they've been trained on. With feature cam, you can build in a configuration that everyone uses so that the strategy and the tool selection is consistent. So let's talk a little bit about cam without standardization. So this is kind of what I was talking about prior. So you've got machinist A and machinist B, they both come in to program this part and you have to program the pocket feature on the top of this mounting plate. Okay, so machinist A decides to use a quarter inch flat end mill if they decide to use a more modern strategy where they're using a aggressive um, step down, but a less aggressive step over. So they're going to machine with the side of the tool and they're going to use an aggressive amount of flute. They're going to do adaptive roughing and then finishing with a pocket. They're going to ramp with a zigzag cutter compensation. They're going to do in control. Ultimately, this leads to a tool path that is efficient and maybe runs in four minutes and 30 seconds. Machinist B comes in. They look at this pocket and they say, well, I want to use a bigger tool. And I'm going to use a large step over. So I'm going to use a lot of the tool, but not very much in depth. So only 50 thousandths of step down. You can see right away, there's a lot of decisions that need to be made. Everything from the tooling to the feeds and speeds, the step downs, the order of operations, how you ramp into the material. And then that all leads into inconsistency. So the way that this is machined ultimately you're gonna end up with the same result, right? Theoretically, both parts might look exactly the same, but Machinist A might've figured something out where they're able to run this and it only takes four minutes and 30 seconds, but then Machinist B creates a program that takes 12 minutes. This is where standard standardization can really help. You can avoid the inconsistencies and you start to share knowledge, which is always a good thing. Um, you can learn from other team members and you can incorporate the things that are working well into the workflow for everybody else. So let's talk about the feature cam workflow and how it's different. You're gonna draw and import your part, <coughs> obviously, same workflow as Fusion 360 or Advanter Cam, but then you identify features. So instead of going and selecting your strategy and your boundary, feature cam automatically finds the type of features that are needed it creates the tools, the feeds and speeds and the strategies for you. So then once you identify those features, all you have to do is simulate and generate your code. And that point you are done. So it's extremely fast, but you still have the ability to add in the parameters that you want. The advantage is it does 90% of the work for you. The final 10% of work, you can spend time fine tuning the program and you're not worried about there being any inconsistency or error because it uses the settings that you had defined prior. 
So it automatically determines what operations to use, what tool sizes are required. It calculates the feeds and speeds based off of the material. It finds your stepovers, your Z increments, generates the toolpath, and produces the NC code. It does all of this in one step. So instead of having to go through 10 different steps for each individual feature, it does the entire part in one step. So what's the impact of this? Well, obviously, uh, reduce programming time, right? I don't need to tell you that. It's gonna be a lot faster. The other thing you get with this is standardization. So you're able to share knowledge, you're able to use the same processes and parameters every time. That improves consistency and allows you to capture machining knowledge. So if you find something when you're programming that runs really well on the machine, you can save that and apply it to the next job that comes through the door. So your parts are gonna be more consistent, more accurate, and you can provide more accurate quotes. So let's say a customer asks for a quote on a part that you need to machine. You can generate the tool path quickly and give them an estimate for cost that will most likely be accurate because you know what the program is going to look like. And at that point, you already have it programmed if they do move forward with the job. So how does FeatureCam do this? Um, one of the things that it has is called machining configurations. When you create your features, it will pull the information from your machining configurations or machining attributes into that automation. So the settings that you define in the attributes, this is things like stepovers, leads, ramps, um, the preferences you create in here are directly used in the automation of the toolpaths. So if you say that you always want to create a spot drill, when you program your holes, it will automatically add a spot drill. If you say that you always want to use a um, quarter inch step down on roughing operations, it will always use a quarter inch step down on roughing operations. So you can control what feature cam is using to automate your programming. So it's almost like you are pulling the strings in the background. So as you identify something that works or something you'd like to use moving forward, you can add it into your attributes or your configuration. And then the next person that goes in and programs, those settings will automatically be applied. So you can standardize across your team. This is also going to improve consistency and safety. So you can make sure that the tool paths that are created are safe, uh, that you're not going to damage the tool or damage the machine. You can build that intelligence in. What's great about this as well is it's not just for milling. You can apply these attributes to turning operations and wire operations. So you can have unique settings and unique processes for mill, turn, and wire. You can also have multiple configurations. So it might be that you have specific settings you like to use on your three axis mill, but maybe that's different than what you use on your five axis mill. Each CNC machine could have its own set of attributes that are used every time you create a program for that specific controller. The other thing you get with FeatureCam is automatic tool selection. So what it does is it looks at the stock material that you have defined. So here we have stainless 201 as our material. Then for milling, drilling, turning, and wire EDM, you can specify based off of the tool grade and the material what feeds and speeds you want to use for profiling, slotting, facing, and plunging for milling, for instance, right here. So what you can do is as soon as you switch to a different material, it will automatically pull from these feed and speed cutting tables. So you don't have to worry about setting the correct feeds and speeds each time. You can automate that based off your material selection. What you can also do is adjust this for each type. So each strategy, whether it's drilling, milling, or turning. The other options you have in the machining configurations is the ability to set clearance requirements. So you can specify how much clearance you want between the cutter and the holder for pocketing operations. 
So then when it generates the tool path, it'll make sure it chooses a tool that meets your clearance requirements. That way you didn't, don't get too close to um, hitting the holder and gouging, or you can activate shank clearance and it will create clearance from the actual shank of the tool so that you, you won't accidentally collide with a non-cutting portion. So within the actual tool library, you can set up your feed and speed tables. And then within the configurations of feature cam, you can set up clearance requirements. So all this plays into choosing a tool that's going to be running at the correct speed, but also clearing your workpiece by an appropriate amount. So feature recognition, what the program is going to do is identify features. So these are things like pockets. You've got a boss, you've got holes. On a turned part, this would be a turned profile, could be a side, could be a groove, maybe a bore. Feature cam will look at the part and intelligently recognize what these features are. It will then break that down into strategies. So for a pocket, that might mean a roughing and a finishing. For a hole, that might mean a spot drill and then a peck, and then maybe a counter bore or a tap. So it segments each feature up into the appropriate strategies and choose the tools that are required. So this can be done automatically. Automatic feature recognition will choose all the features for you. You can then kind of filter through the list and remove ones that you do not want to program, but it identifies them live right in front of you. With automatic feature recognition, you don't have a whole lot of choice over what is picked up and what is not. With directed AFR, which is the other option, what it can do is you can apply filters. So maybe you don't want to recognize any holes. You can exclude holes. Or maybe you don't want to recognize um, any pockets. You could clear pockets from your list or exclude features smaller than a specific diameter. So that's really nice if you have a part where you know that maybe you don't want it to recognize um, a complex um, hole that you're going to be doing something else with. You could have the feature recognition only focus on holes or only focus on specific items that you know you need help with. Otherwise, you can go through and kind of do each feature one by one. Um, but automatic feature recognition works extremely well, especially if the part is mostly 2.5D or 3D. Um, when you get into more complex 5-axis parts, you might need to use more of the directed AFR. So finally, we've talked a lot about standardization. Another way that you can improve standardization and improve consistency is with Vault. So Autodesk has recently launched what's called Vault for Make. This is specifically tailored to um, feature cam and power mill. So your more um, standard cam products. So feature cam and power mill in the past, there wasn't really a link to Vault, which means all the revision control is done in engineering, but as soon as it goes to the shop floor or the CAM team, if there's changes that are made to the NC program, nobody's keeping track of those. That change might just live on the machine controller. It might, be, it might live in somebody's folder on their desktop somewhere on a laptop. There's not much control over changes that are made to the CAM program or the NC code. What Vault does is if you implement Vault, this allows you to track the changes and release the CAM program and the NC code as you're going through the workflow, which means if the machinist realizes that one of the program features is not going to work on the machine, maybe you don't have the correct tool, maybe that you don't have the correct um, spindle speed, they can request a change with a feedback loop. So when the part is released to manufacturing, they can say, hey, this is not going to work, send it back to engineering. Engineering can make that change. It then gets pushed through as a second revision. So you're keeping track of changes to the geometry as well as changes to the actual NC program. Traditionally, this loop did not exist, but now you can actually track and manage changes to the NC code. The nice thing with that is you can ensure that what's on the machine is safe. You can eliminate rework. And let's say three months from now, you have a customer come back and want the same part. You can just go grab that NC file and run it. And you know 
because you're pulling it from the vault, you know that it is the correct revision, it's the correct program, and you're not gonna be machining something that's outdated. So vault gives you that ability to create that loop and that feedback between manufacturing and engineering. So an example life cycle you would see, you've got your CAD design phase and your production phase. The feature cam and power mill aspects where you're creating the program traditionally were not linked with engineering. So engineering would send the file out and then it was a black box, right? Your cam team and your shop floor, they do what they need to do to get the part manufactured, but there's not any control over revisions that are made to the programming. Now you create that cam design phase where there's time to revise and track those revisions before it actually goes to production. And you can even create a revision loop for the actual NC code. So if the NC code makes it all the way to the machine and then there's an issue, you could revise that and include that change in Vault as well. So this makes sure that you are connecting all of your design phases from CAD to CAM to production. You're creating that loop that's so desperately needed. So let's look at some software. Um, it's been a lot of talk so far, but I wanted to show you guys what you can actually do here and some of the differences. So first, we'll start with Fusion 360. This would be your traditional <clears throat> CAM software where you've got a lot of the same tools, it's just not as automated. So for machining this pocket right here, for instance, what I would need to do is choose a strategy. So a 2D strategy or a 3D strategy. Again, lots of options here. And there's no one really sitting behind me looking over my shoulder telling me what to do. So I might decide, well, I wanna do an adaptive clearing operation on the top. I'm gonna to go choose a tool. Maybe I decide to use this uh, roughing end mill. So I decide a 3 8 end mill is what I wanna use. I might come in tomorrow and be in a different mood and decide to use a half inch end mill. So there's really no control over what's being used here. Um, for the geometry, I can then say, well, I wanna machine out maybe this pocket all the way to the boundary, something like this. So I have to choose where I want to machine. Then I can say, well, how much stock do I wanna leave? Let's say I wanna leave 30 thousandths of an inch actually and radially, and then my optimal load here. This is my step over, 0.15. And then maybe I wanna apply a step down of an eighth of an inch. I'll go ahead and do that and click okay. And it creates my tool path looking something like that. So I can go back in and say, well, maybe I don't need to use a step down. I can start making changes to the way that I machine this until I find something that I like. Then I can go through, add in my finishing pass to this face as well. So maybe I just go through and I finish out this face with a traditional 2D pocket method. So I'm not gonna leave any stock on this one click OK, I've got my finishing operation. <clears throat> so the order of operations that I choose, so how I rough it and how I finish it, that's up to my discretion. The other thing in here is the feeds and speeds. So I can create presets based off of the material, but I need to know what material I'm using and I need to make sure that these spindle speeds and cutting feed rates are right every time. Another thing is if I realize later on that on the machine, it runs better at 10,000 RPM and I make the change here and I click okay, it changes it for this tool path. But the next time I go in here to program, it might not automatically pick up that it needs to be 10,000 RPM. So the knowledge that I gained when I programmed this and ran it on the machine is not shared with anyone else. Only I know the changes that I made and what's working well when I'm programming this. Another issue you'll run into with traditional cam is drilling holes. Um, so when you go to drill a hole, you have to decide <clears throat> how you want to approach it. So something like this, it might be a spot drill and then a drill for that half inch hole. So I have to go through and choose my strategy. I have to go find an appropriate spot drill. I have to go search for the spot drill that I want. So maybe I go to spot drills and I search or I might have one that exists that I already want to use. Maybe I just know that I want to use this 90 degree quarter inch. 
again, I have to go determine what spot drill to use. I have to choose the holes that I want to program. And then I have to identify how I want to do this. So do I want to do a specific depth? Maybe a 50 thousandth of an inch spot drill. Something like that. Just to pack at it. Now I've got my spot drill operation and I can proceed. So the issue with this is for every single operation, I have to choose the tool. I have to figure out my feeds and speeds. Notice next time I went in to create an operation, it switched back to 12,000 RPM. <clears throat> so you have to manage this and keep track of it as you go. I also have to make selections like what pocket to use, what step over to use, what step down to use, how much stock to leave, what ramp do I want to use, plunge or helix? <clears throat> There's a lot going on here. These menus leave a lot of room for customization, but also a lot of room for error. So the advantage of feature cam is I don't have to worry so much about choosing the correct tool, choosing the correct boundary. It automates that workflow for me so I can focus my attention on fine tuning. So things like um, surface finish, um, step over, step down, I can focus on what I need to focus on. So if I switch to feature cam and I am looking at the same exact part, same exact setup, I need to program this. So what I'm going to do on this one is I'm just going to go to automatic feature recognition. It asks me for what body I want to recognize. There's a bunch of bodies in here because I have this fixture. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the one I want, which is this one right here, and click next. It says, what setup do you want to recognize? What's really neat about feature cam is I could actually have multiple tool orientations, and it, it will recognize the features for each orientation individually. In this case, I'm just looking at one perspective. So I'll click Next. It just recognized all the features. So it found that there's some side features, some pockets, some holes, and some counterbores. It found all those features. So I'll just click Finish. And over here on the left, it created all of the tool paths, finishing, roughing, drilling, counterboring. It shows all of the tools. It shows the feeds and the speeds based off of my stock, which was defined as being stainless steel 201. So it used the feed and speed tables I had chosen, creates all of my tool paths and tools. And so then, I am done. If I go to 3D and I simulate this, I'm jumping right into simulating and verifying that this is the toolpath that I want. And it even tells me if there's a collision. So right away, I'm focusing my attention on safety rather than trying to figure out the toolpath or the tool is correct. So I have a possible collision. It's going to let me know where that's at. And I can see I need to make some adjustments. So I can go into defining what tool needs to be chosen. So it automates almost the entire process. And all I need to do is maybe tweak a couple of tool settings and then I'm off and running. So all of that is generated automatically. Now, let's say that I want to change my approach. So maybe I realize that the way that I am currently machining this face, I want to do a little differently. So in my simulation, the way that it's done right now is it's going to rough it out and it's doing it all in one step and then just finishing the sidewalls. It didn't finish the face with a secondary toolpath. So maybe that's a change I wanna make. Another thing you'll notice is right now, it's not doing any spot drilling. So after it's done with this first setup, when it goes to drill, the way this is set up right now is it's going to just come in with the drill and go right through it. So I'm not doing any spot drilling or center drilling. When I get to this, the drills, you'll see that. It's going to finish the sides. And that's just going right into my drill with no spot drill. So maybe that's a change I want to make as well. So as you're programming, you identify these little subtle changes. And you can make changes to this in either the machining configuration, which will affect the settings for the entire feature cam platform, or the machining attributes. Attributes are specific to this document. Configurations will adjust 
configurations for the entire feature cam software so I can use them across the board. So a lot of times I like to start with attributes and once I feel good about the attributes, I can copy these over to my configuration. So in here, you'll notice there's things like drilling. How do I want to approach my drilling cycle? Well, I wanna activate spot drilling. So I'm gonna turn spot drilling on. I can even specify if I'd like to um, do just drilling or maybe I wanna do a drill mill combination if I'm doing a lot of counterboring. I can specify the different cycles that I want to use for drills and taps and how I want to do reams and bores. I have control over all this. I can even specify the max tap spindle RPM. So I have control on how the software recognizes the features and applies these tool paths. If I go to milling, maybe I decide that I would like to change um, cutter comps. Maybe I want to use cutter compensation on my roughing passes. I'll go ahead and activate that setting so it'll allow in the G code for cutter compensation on my roughing passes. So I can type that value in on the machine control. Step overs. So maybe I decide that I want to change this. If I go to bottom finishing right here, finished bottom is not turned on. This would finish the bottom of a pocket or a face with its own tool path. So you'll leave a little bit of material and then you'll finish it um, when you finish the side walls of a pocket as well. So I'm going to turn finish bottom on. It's going to be a spiral cut. And maybe I want to do a zigzag with 80% of the tool diameter. I can put that value in. And then this finish bottom allowance is how much material will be left on the bottom before I go back and finish it. So 50 thousandths of an inch should be good. So I'll click OK. That will activate bottom finishing. Let's say I want to take a look at the operations. And I go to automatic options. This controls how it orders the tool path. So you notice. I didn't really specify the order in which I want to run operations. It bases it off of minimizing tool changes, which is usually a good thing. But maybe I want to make sure that I do my finished cuts last. So it's going to rough the entire part out and then do all of my finishing at the end. That might lead to more tool changes, but it is maybe easier to process and easier to set up in the fixture that way. So I'll go ahead and just say do finish cuts last. Notice over here on the right when I did that. Watch these operations. So when I click it, it reorders it so the roughing and drilling is first and it does the counterboring and finishing last. So what's really neat is as soon as you check this box, it's already doing this intelligently in the background live as I'm making these changes. So I'm gonna specify do finish cuts last, click okay. And let's say I'm good with that for now. Click okay, it re, orders the tool paths, and you'll notice now, when I simulate, it's gonna do my roughing, so it's gonna rough and drill. And notice, remember I specified spot drill? It's now going to do a spot drill operation as well, so it's gonna do all of my roughing. And now it's gonna spot drill and drill. And then the final thing that it's gonna do is the finishing operations. So it saves my finishing for the end because I made that one of my preferences. So again, you're able to set your preferences and apply those so that the next time you program this, it does it the correct way, the way that you want it to. So it's gonna finish the bottom of this now and then it detects a collision still. So I'm still needing to fix a couple things, but it automatically reordered and adjusted my tool pass to my preference, which is using a spot drill, finishing the bottom, whatever that is. So now I need to fix the issue of my tool selection. Clearly it's choosing a tool that's not safe, right? It's choosing a tool that does not have enough cutter. So what I can do in my machining attributes for tool selection, I can specify my tool holder clearance settings. So I'm gonna to go to tool holder clearance. And I'm gonna say, I want to um, set a clearance requirement off the setup with an additional 50% clearance for the tool shank. I'm gonna to give a tool selection error if it doesn't meet requirements. The other option here is you can select the tool closest, which means if there is a gouge, it'll just choose a tool that's closest to making the clearance. 
And then you can go in and maybe just uh, choose a slightly longer tool. Um, you might have to buy one in that case, but it'll at least give you a tool that's closest and then you can make decisions from there. I prefer to activate this where it actually gives me an error rather than just letting it go. This will make sure that no matter who's programming, there's always plenty of clearance for the tool, as well as the shank if you activate this checkbox. So I'll click OK, click OK. And then what I'll do is I'll actually start from scratch here. So I'll show you guys what you get. So I'm going to go back in and do a whole new feature recognition with my new settings. Click finish. And you'll notice it's going to give me a couple of errors. The first error it gave right here is that the spot drill doesn't have enough clearance. Down here, you'll see the finish pass. It says that that tool also does not meet the requirements. So what it does is it identifies what tool paths are giving you problems. So what I can do is I can go into my side feature here. And you'll notice for that lower section, it's giving me an error for this roughing tool path and it can't find a tool that matches my requirements. So I can do go is do basically just decide which ones I want to use. Maybe I say, well, I'm pretty confident that this uh, half inch long end mill will work. So I'll choose that and click apply. And it applies it to the roughing and finishing tool paths. And now that solves the problem. So that tool is going to have enough clearance. So sometimes the software can't figure out what tool to use or the tool that it automatically selects does not have enough clearance. If that's the case, it'll give you that warning. And then you can identify what tool is going to work. Maybe you create a new tool that has enough clearance and select that for your tool path. So by activating those attributes, you can make it so that errors are less likely to happen because it will automatically find those issues ahead of time before you get too far into the programming process. And that way you don't miss any potential collisions or gouges that can occur. So maybe I decide for that lower segment, so this other hole right here, maybe I can't find a hole that has quite the right, or a spot drill has quite the right amount of clearance. What I might do is go in there and just for this, turn spot drilling off. And then go ahead and simulate this to see what I get. So everything should look the same, but for that final finishing pass, I've switched to a longer tool with more flute. So when I simulate, Notice now it's using this half inch cutter that has enough flute to clear the sidewall so I don't get that gouge with the shank of the tool. So I identified the issue, it told me what the problem is, and I can then go change the tool, update my programming, and it's good to go. And what's really neat about FeatureCam is when I create this simulation over on the right hand side here, you'll see that it shows all of my settings, but then also there's the NC code right here it automatically generated my NC code that I can then save out to my machine. So I don't have to go through a separate process where I figure out what post processor to use and how to generate that code. I had the Haas VF post processor already specified. So it generated code for my Haas VF controller automatically. And as soon as you make a change, so let's say I were to go back in and update my attributes. So maybe I change my operation order again i'll just re-simulate with the new operation order and now the nc code has been updated with the new operation order that i specified so if you make changes all you have to do is rerun the simulation and your code is automatically generated you're not spending time trying to figure out what code is the most recent it already does it for you and you're ready to go. So this part is something you could program in a matter of seconds compared to doing it with the traditional CAM software where this might take me 15 or 20 minutes at the least. Now, like I said, you can share this with a machine configuration. So let's say I create a new machine configuration called my demo configuration. These can be used across the board for all feature CAM parts. So what I might say is for automatic op ordering, I always want to do finish cuts last for my tool selection. Maybe I want to always maintain clearance from the setup by an additional 10% of the depth 
of the, the setup depth. So I'll always maintain 10% of the overall um, thickness of the stock. And I'll make sure I clear the stock with the shank as well. Uh, maybe for my step overs, I always want to do that bottom finishing. So I'll go ahead and specify those. Milling, I want to keep all this. And then drilling, I'll do a spot drill. So I'm sort of just tweaking this, maybe for my leads. Um, for my helical options, I want to do like a 75% of my tool diameter, maybe a ramp angle of five degrees. So I'll make some changes to my configurations for my mills, click OK, and now my demo config is ready to go. So now, if I create a new feature cam document, when I go to create my initial setup, I can specify what configurations use. So I'm going to use my demo configuration here that I just created and click create new document. And I'll go ahead and just import in a new model. So I'll import in this model shown here so you can see what it looks like. Obviously different geometry, but I'm probably going to be using a lot of the same principles here. So I'll go ahead and click next. I'm going to go ahead and align my Z. Calculate my stock block. Create my work coordinate system. Make sure that that's all set the way that I want. And now this is ready for feature recognition. So I can click AFR, click next. It identifies all the features of my part. And I'll click finish. So it generates all of my operations and there's a lot of holes and pockets in here. It just programmed that whole part. And you'll notice it's doing all the roughing passes first and all the finishing passes last. That's because in my machining configuration, I had that set up. You'll also notice that it is doing a spot drill. I have that specified in my machining configuration. And it's finishing the bottom of these pockets. So if I simulate, you'll see it. It's going to use the same principles that I applied to my other part, but I don't have to remember what I did. It's saved in that configuration and it's applied moving forward anytime I activate that. So it's going to go ahead and grab all the tools required. Link the tool path together with my tools. And as I simulate this, so it's going to load the simulation. It's also going to generate the NC code in the background. So we'll let this run. It's generating the Vortex toolpath for all my roughing right now. So it's going to go and put that together. So the biggest advantage of these configurations, again, is that number one, you don't have to remember the changes you make. But number two, you can share those changes with other team members. So right away, I identified maybe a gouge. Looks like I might have wrapped it, wrapped it into the stock. So I'll have to go fix that spot drill. But it's going to do all the drilling operations first. So it's doing all my roughing. So drill, it's going to drill and rough. So I might do my roughing before I do the drilling. That way I don't have that gouge. So I'll reorder that. But it's going to go ahead and do all these pockets with a rough first. And then it's going to finish later based off my operation order. So I'll program this whole part. It chooses the correct tools based off my settings. Does all the drilling and then all the finishing. And then I'm good to go. So I verified that I've got my tools, my feeds and speeds. That's all done automatically. If I go to my NC code, it automatically generated the NC code for me. And I can just save this out. And it's ready to run on the machine. Just like that. So really, biggest differences is that strategy and tool automation. That's really what sets Feature Cam apart. Um, it's hopefully that's something that you guys will find advantageous. Um, and I think it's something that will really modernize your CAM workflow. Um, and it's worth giving it a try.